Yeah, so my name is Niet uh, Koen van der Bekelaar. Typically, for non-Dutch speakers, I uh, tell them to forget my last name, really difficult to pronounce. Over here, I believe that most of you can pronounce my last name. And uh, I'm going to talk about security, and especially I'm going to talk about how we, within Amazon Web Services, look at security. And I think one of my main objectives is to, for this session, is to help you understand how we look at security, but second of all, I'd like to challenge you to think about security a little bit different way. And you may even come to the conclusion at the end that security in the cloud may be more secure than on-premise. Um, the first question to the audience is you: who of you is using AWS at this point in time? Wow. Okay, thank you for that, thank you for that. And the second question is, who is already convinced that you can be more secure in the cloud than in an existing environment? Okay, I think I can go home, that's great. So, <laughs> um, and actually, for the, uh, for the full audience then, uh, you also probably are aware that this month we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary. And we started back in 2006. And we started like a basic set of services, I think it was S3, some notification services, and in the end uh, we built it out. And we built it out over the last 10 years. And actually if you look at it right now, we launched over 2,000 services. And this slide was created the 1st of March, so we need to ask Mark to update it. Because the last couple of weeks has been additional services being launched. Actually one of my favorites. Two days ago, we launched RDS SQL Server Windows Authentication, which allows you to run your databases in the cloud and connect to your uh, on-premise Active Directory. And if you look at all the services we have been launching, there's a lot of them. I even saw some internal slides, like 30 to 40% of these services that are security related. And why is that? And the reason for that is that we believe security literally is job zero. Security is a starting point. And if you look at Amazon Web Services, what we deliver, we don't deliver boxes to you. We don't deliver boxes with a big smile that you unpack and you think, oh, that is great, and if it doesn't work, I give a call. We're Amazon Web Services. What we deliver is a logical services to you. Which means that for us, the only way we can really get your trust is making sure that these services are secure, reliable, and performant. And if you look at the 2,000 serve, 2,000 plus new services and features, this is the way we typically represent the AWS service family. And if you look at it, and if you look at the, the slides, and you start to double click on each one of these boxes, what you'll find is the variety of services. You start at the bottom with our infrastructure. And most of you know we have the, the various regions around the globe, we're expanding the number of regions. And on top of that, we build the compute and everything else. And especially everything else, it's really interesting. Like one domain, analytics. So what can you do with analytics? You can look into the past, typical business intelligence, massive amounts of data. You can also look at real time. Real time in terms of crunching what is happening, what is trending topic with my customers right now. But also, we provide services to look into the future. Machine learning, how can you predict certain behaviors based on the data set you currently have. And what I highlight in the middle is the whole set of security services. And there's a right range of security services, starting from identity and access management, Secu uh, encryption, but also we, uh, we launched the web application firewall, which allows you to, <coughs> to host your web application and make sure you secure it the way you like to do it. And <coughs> that brings us to the point that we have one million customers, and one million customers are using AWS. By the way, this excludes the, uh, the Amazon usage. But why should you care? Why should you care about us having one million customers? I think the very single reason for that is that all of our customers receive exactly the same service. Which means that whether you're based in the US, in Ireland, in Singapore, you get exactly the same AWS. 
And then if you think about it, that for us security is job zero, that brings up another interesting question. And the question is, so what do you mean by security is your top priority? What actually it means is that we need to make sure that of the customers that are really demanding, we need to provide those services <coughs> And those services are immediately available to everybody that's using AWS, including the small person sitting on a cellar developing a web application who gets exactly the same service as the large enterprise that's consuming cloud. And <clears throat> so security job zero, I mean, uh, we even had some uh, AWS people on stage stating, you know, we are one big security event away from like a big disaster, and we are. Security is job zero for us. And we have many uh, security experts, actually one of our key security experts sitting in the room over here, Dave Walker. And we get a lot, a lot of questions, and what we try to do is try to help <coughs> our customers to be more secure in AWS Cloud. And I think the fun thing about working for AWS is that we speak to customers. And when we speak to customers, we get quotes back like this. Starting point, Tom from uh, NASA GPL, who made a statement in a private meeting, and he said, you know what, I do believe I can be more secure in AWS and outside. And obviously we asked the question, can you please put that on the slide? And he agreed. Why did he agree? Because he really believes this is where the market is going, and he made a statement a couple of years back. And I don't know if any of you saw the uh, reInvent videos. The reInvent videos, reInvent our yearly uh, training event that was done in Las Vegas this year. And during the initial keynotes, we had a couple of big customers on stage, including BMW, including John Deere, and including Capital One. And Rob Alexander from Capital One was starting to discuss around his 9,000 applications, 300 ERP, moving to AWS. And if you consider the fact, Capital One, and whilst all of your uh, financial customers, one of the biggest financial institutions in the US, making a statement like this, he can be more secure in AWS and outside, it's something we're pretty much proud of. And then, one thing that often comes up when we discuss security of our customers is, do I need to throw everything overboard what I do know about security? And actually the answer is, it depends, yes or no. No, you do not, because your existing processes, your existing compliance, your existing security requirements are still valid in the cloud. Don't throw it overboard, use it. And at the same time, there will be things that can help you think differently when you do security in the cloud. So we'll get back to that in a second. And also with security, we just discussed is that all of our customers get the same service. And it also means where do we put our bar? Where do we put the bar of our security level? And how do we make sure that we reach the bar of the highest? That means that we are providing these type of services that are made available. One example is uh, we had one really big customer asking us, I want to move everything to AWS, but at the same time, what I'd also like to do is to fully manage my own encryption keys. Can you host my machines to do those encryption? Well, this is how Cloud HSM started, which is now a service available to everybody using AWS. <coughs> Sorry. And if you now look at AWS, how do we do security internally? How do we make sure that security is job zero and we can provide the best service to our customers? I think the starting point here is security needs to be simple. Simple principles, simple guidelines, easy to enforce, easy to audit. Let me give you one example. Within our data centers, we have a very, very simple rule, which is there's no storage leaving the AWS data center in one piece. Period. As the drive, hard disk drives, regardless, nothing leaves the AWS data center intact. Which means the only thing you will get 
is this, and it depends a little bit if it's as is D drive or a spinning drive. Spinning drive, you can first degauss and then make it small pieces. As a D drive, D gauss, it doesn't work, so you make smaller pieces. So this is what you will get. Easy principle, easy to enforce, nobody leaves AWS data center with uh, storage. <clears throat> it also means that how do we look at our internal controls? And I think we've got like over 700 controls that we have in place and we enforce. And one of the things we do is we vet AWS employees. What does it mean to vet AWS employees? It means that every single AWS employee, when he or she joins AWS, there's a background check. And the background check varies per country, varies per region, but what we try to do is to move to the highest level that we can achieve within that uh, geography. And that allows us to answer questions like, did this person have any criminal background? Or did he or she hack into the computer system at school? And that gives us a point in time picture. A point in time picture at this point in time where you hire an AWS employee and now we're moving forward. But obviously then the second question is, so what happens afterwards? What happens when an AWS employee is on board and is moving forward and one way or the other can affect customer data? What happens in our situation is the vetting continues. Every single employee gets a least privilege access. And least privilege access means what do you need to have in order to, need to do your job? And that's it. And if you can reduce that, we'll reduce that. That also means I'm a solutions architect. And it is my role to help large enterprises get the best out of the AWS cloud. Is it required for me to understand and to know what the AWS data center is? <coughs> no, it is not. Do I know what the AWS data center is? No, I do not. I know the regions, I know the availability zones, I know the details that are required for customers to benefit from it, but I've never visited an AWS data center and I will never will. Too bad. <coughs> it also means that um, there's a clear distinction between what we can do and where you come in. And we'll get back to that in a second. We call it our shared security model. But one of the key elements in the shared security model is we do not touch your data. If you have virtual machines, EC2 machines in the AWS cloud, we cannot look inside your machine. We sometimes have tickets being open to our customer support. I have an application, and can you please look at my application log? Well, I'm really sorry, we cannot, unless you give me the data. And shared security model means that we take care of the security of the cloud, and we allow you to be secure in the cloud. We give you tools, we give you mechanisms, and it's up to you to make yourself <laughs> secure in the cloud by using that. And we provide the basics. And what we mean by the basics is we provide the underlying, uh, first of all, the physical security, but second of all, we secure all the compute, all the database, and all the networking. And on top of that, we provide you all of the tools and best practices in order for you to design and architect yourself in the cloud in the way you'd like it to do. And we just discussed that the AWS services are equal across the globe. So what does that mean? It means, again, that the services in the US and Ireland and Singapore are the same. It also means that every vertical gets the same AWS service. So that's an interesting point, because then if you look into compliance and regulations, it means that if we <coughs> want customers to allow to be compliant with HIPAA regulations, and it means that we need to make sure that all of the AWS services that you can use for being HIPAA compliant are equal. Same applies if you want to store credit card information, BCI, DSS, same thing. So it's one platform and all of these different certification regulations apply. <coughs> and it also means that you can choose the way you'd like to be secure in the cloud. 
and you can use native AWS services, you can use partner services, we've got a great example coming up with Splunk, but in the end, you have the option to design and architect the way you'd like to be secure in the cloud. And that brings us also to the, sorry, That brings us also to the continuity, uh, you know, business uh, continuity. How do you want your redundancy being set up? Well, what you can do, you've got a developer, and the developer wants a single database, and my single database needs to be available from 9 to 5. I don't care about redundancy. And that's perfectly fine. We can provide that. At the same time, you may have production databases, and your production database needs to be high performant, needs to be 24 over 7, and please, please, please make sure they're redundant. If there's any failure anywhere, I want to make sure that my database, my business application, and my customers can still use the database service. So over here, the question is, what is security? Because in the end, security is not a switch. It's not like yes or no, I am secure. Security is really dependent on what you'd like to achieve on the balance between your business goals on one hand and your controls, your regulations, and the protection of the same customers on the other hand. <clears throat> and that brings us to the point that we provide the audited controls, so we have a third-party auditor that's auditing all of our internal 700 plus controls. And the same like I'm not allowed to visit the data center, you often get questions from customers, can I please visit the data center? And I think it's a really legitimate question. I mean, you want to see, you know, where is my stuff, how is it, what is going on? And then it's up to us to explain, well, you know what, I understand the question. It's not something we can do, actually for a variety of reasons. The first reason is we have one million customers. You want to have one million customers going to the data centers. We have buses like it's a Disney World. But second of all, if you can visit the data center and there's somebody else visit the data center as well, do you want this person to work to the same rex? Hmm, actually that's a good point. No, we do not. At the same time, we want to make sure Security is not like trust relationship, it's a trust and verify relationship. Which means AWS is providing the different compliances, the SOC 1, the SOC 2, PCI DSS, and these are audited by third parties and uh, the compliance statements are available publicly on the web, by the way. <coughs> also shared security model means we provide the support, we try to help you. We try to help you to be secure in AWS. And I don't know if anybody here has been working with Trusted Advisor, but Trusted Advisor is actually quite a simple but powerful service. And Trusted Advisor is part of support. What Trusted Advisor does, it checks your AWS accounts and it provides you a readout and recommendations. For example, on security, you have a set of uh, EC2 instances open to the wide world for SSH 422. Are you really sure you want to do that? The answer may be yes. I mean, I've got a set of developers for the next couple of days. They will log in via uh, you know, any different types of location and simply in the process setting up Bastion House, setting up my security, etc. That may be the case. Is it best practice? Not really. Is it something we highlight? Yes, we do. So basically what we do is we provide you the insights and also we provide you the double click in terms of please take some action here. Or take a conscious decision, you do not want to action this. And Trusted Advisor, uh, part of support, is not only security, it also provides recommendations on costs, on your uh, performance and on your availability. Other thing is, uh, it also looks at your security credentials. Root credentials. Are you really sure you want to have root not enabled with 2FA? Are you really sure that you want to do that? It's not best practice. It's something that Trusted Advisor will highlight to you. <coughs> and if we security people speak and often, at least in my uh, history, 
I realized that we are seen as the bloggers. I mean, we are seen as the bloggers, hey, you know what, you cannot do this because of security regulations 1, 2, 3, or third party control A, B, C. And what we see now happening in the market is actually a little bit of reverse, that security can be a catalyst, can be a helper in order to be agile and at the same time being secure. Traditional way of looking at security was security is slow, security is a blocker, etc. Well, we might need to rethink that. And I think one of the points is security isn't an art or a science. And we can have a long debate about it, but I think in the end it will be both. Why? The art part of security is that on one hand you want to provide all the business data, all the enterprise applications to your business owners in order to serve their customers when they need it, how they need it, etc. At the same time, you want to protect the same customers, you want to comply to external and third party regulations, and that's the a fine balancing act. That's the balancing act, that's the art part of security. And then the science part of security is, okay, how can I create implement, monitor, and improve controls in order to meet a business goal. Science and art, same thing. And then if you look at security in terms of the paradigm shift, so we just discussed like security from a, a regulation processes, many things stay the same, but also things are different. And I think the very, um, old ways, if you go back to the Middle Ages, uh, there was no IT security, it was something else, it was physical security. And the typical way of looking at security is build one big firewall around the city and that's it, that will protect me. Somebody comes in, hey, excuse me, but if somebody <coughs> climbs over that wall, what do we do? Do we still have security in that wall? And that's the same way if you look at legacy IT and a new potential way of doing things in the cloud. In terms of, you don't have like one big firewall and all the rest is up for grabs. No, what you do is, you build small perimeters, you build microservices, and you own just enough what you want to own in order to provide a business service. And if you look at it, and if you look at the way that you can architect things in AWS, for me there's two points jumping out. One is, that the majority of services is API driven. And why should you care that all the services are API driven? Well, you should care because you get a central point that allows you to control AWS. There's no hidden backdoor. This is the way you do it. Whether or not you use a console, you use a CLI, or you use an API, regardless, it's an API call. And the advantage of API calls is you can log them. And the other thing is the continuous improvement. I mean, for some customers, actually, this also is a, is a headache. Why is it a headache? Because, oh, you know what? Every week there's a new AWS service. And that is true. But at the same time, you build something and you check what is available and you move things forward in order to be more secure. But also it allows you to be agile and adjust to different market situations, different security threats, and with this approach, it allows you to evolve over time. <clears throat> and then from a mindset perspective, so the mindset perspective is the security on one hand, a team sitting somewhere blocking progress. What we really, really believe that security needs to be embedded in the organization needs to embed it in your processes, needs to embed it in people's mind, but also it is distributed. Every team is responsible for security. Every team. It's enabled by central team, but every team takes responsibility in this. It's embedded in the way you do business, and it's embedded in the way you provide services to your end customers, whether or not it's internal or external. And then if you double click on the shared security model and you look at 
a full stack of services. So we start the physical security, who can enter the door, do we have CTTV, do we have logging of video, do we have 2FA access, etc., etc., up to the application layer. And what you will see is that things vary where you are in the stack, which means the lower end, that's up to us, that's up to AWS, the high end, that's up to you. Shared security model. You own your own application security. And in the middle, things are API driven, and you can use the APIs, you can use third party applications in order to make yourself secure in the cloud. <coughs> now, security is job zero, security is shared, and there's a different way of looking at security. But then let's come to the following point. And the following point is, you cannot be secure if you don't know what to secure. In other words, visibility. How do I know what I have running in terms of my infrastructure, in terms of my applications, in terms of my network equipment? And <clears throat> I come from a networking background, and I often had discussions with customers, okay, can you tell me what's going on in your network right now? And, well, some customers answer, well, you know what, that is fine, I do an audit every year and I check what's in there, I create a marvelous Excel sheet with like a zillion macros and it's working. And to be honest, that's better than what I've seen in most situations. At the same time, what will happen on one year plus one? Things are going to change. Things are going to change and there may be situations that, well, I don't know if you recognize this, like a, a typical data center, but if you walk to data centers and you point at an individual server and you ask, okay, what does this thing do? Well, you know what? I'm not totally sure. It was installed two years back, the employee left, and that's it. Okay, let's turn it off. Well, no, not really, because I think it does some business function, and I have no clue what it does. And I'm not saying that's a situation everywhere, but what happens in AWS and AWS, these situations are impossible. And why are these situations impossible? For the very same reason that all of the interaction that you are having with AWS is an API call. Everything is an API call, whether or not you want to launch an EC2 machine, you want to launch a massive big data cluster, you want to start machine learning, or you want to create really cool Internet of Things applications, everything is an API call. It's a system-to-system -system call, and the advantage of system-to-system -system call, it is locked, and you can always retrieve back the information. So as an example, well, if you use AWS, you will recognize this view. It's our typical console, the way you interact with AWS, and what you see here is, what are my EC2 instances, my virtual machines, I currently have running in my account. And you can retrieve this information on the console. If you have more than 1,000, I would not recommend you to do so. But regardless, you can get this information and, and take your action. And everything is locked. So what does it mean for us? It means Cloud Trail. Cloud Trail means every single API call is locked to a bucket of your choice, to an S3 bucket of your choice. And an API call is simply something like somebody tried to log in, somebody updated the bucket, somebody updated the file, somebody created a new user. Any, any interaction is being locked and stored in CloudTrail and you can use it. And the interesting thing about CloudTrail is that it will allow you for security and auditability, but also we see quite some customers that are using CloudTrail to do operations and operation debugging. Why? If something happens, if you see a degrading, degrading a service, and you want to go back, what happened? Who changed the firewall rule? Who closed the bucket? CloudTrail is a perfect place to go. The related service is AWS Config. And what does AWS Config do? AWS Config looks at your AWS resources your EC2 machines, your firewall, your VPC, and logs the current state. 
What does it mean? How does it look right now in terms of my AWS resource? At the same time, it also looks at the history. So you can go back in time and look, what happened? What was the situation two weeks back, three weeks back, six months back? Who made a change here and what's the current situation right now? And that's AWS Config. And what we also recently launched, and uh, after break, Dave will give a, a more rough introduction, is AWS Config Rules. And what does AWS Config Rules do? AWS Config Rules allows you to create rules. And a rule might be a situation, you know what, I want my EBS volumes that I connect to my EC2 machines to be encrypted. If you are not encrypted, please raise the flag immediately. That's what Config Rules does. Config Rules checks your AWS inventory, your AWS Config, looks at your rules, and gives you the report whether or not it is compliant to your rule, yes or no. And if it's not, you can take action, but also you can define <coughs> automated <coughs> proactive actions. AWS Config Rules allows you to create. <coughs> now, the interesting thing about CloudTrail Config and Config Rules is it gives you a massive amount of data. And it gives you a massive amount of data, and a massive amount of data, you need to do something with it in order to make sense out of it. And there's a variety of ways to do so. Um, for example, internally we use massive Hadoop clusters in order to check for any irregular, irregularities sorry, uh, about who's accessing our AWS services. At the same time, there's a lot of partner uh, partners that provide services on top that consume all of these logs, all of these files, and Dominique afterwards will give you an explanation how Splunk does this, and it gives you the insight and the control on top of that. <coughs> Going back to control, so we have the visibility and now we want to control. But with respect to security, what do you want to control? Well, you want to control, control everything. And what does it mean, everything? Let's first look at your most important thing, your data. Your data can be customer data, your data can be internal data, but regardless, you want to make sure that your data is secure, but at the same time, remember, the art side of it, provide what needs to be provided to your business. And we often get questions going back from customers, do you move data across? Well, the thing is, we do not. If you store data in one region, an island, in Frankfurt, next year in London, we will not move your data. We will replicate your data within that single region in order to allow you to be high available. That is true. We will not replicate to any different region. What you can do, if you wish to, you can replicate it. You can do anything and move data across to any location on the globe. That's up to you. That's not something that we will do. Also, <clears throat> you can control, with respect to data, your life cycle. A uh, nice example here is Glacier Vault Lock. And uh, Glacier Vault Lock, our cold storage, allows you to create a vault, but literally a vault, which allows you to store data right once, read many, no delete. You cannot delete this data. Some customers require this in order to be compliant with regulations, then use vault lock. Security, uh, sorry, encryption. <coughs> there's different ways of doing encryption, and as part of our uh, 10 years anniversary, there's a, a nice blog post by our CTO, Werner Vogels, and uh, what he did is he listed 10 lessons learned over the past year. And actually it's quite interesting if you read the blog post, it's uh, allthingsdistributed.com. <coughs> and what he marks is many things are security related. And one thing about security, you mentioned security needs to be from the ground up. Think about security literally from day zero. Second point is, uh, Encryption is first-class citizen. Always, always encrypt your data. 
Remember, make security control simple, always encrypt your data. You can have a second discussion, how do you want to encrypt your data? And how do you encrypt your data, for us, links back to how, what level of control do you want to have, what level of flexibility do you want to have? And just coming back to the, uh, to the, region, uh, the region discussions, these are our regions, and we'll need to update this slide very soon, uh, because as you probably know, we have announced a set of different regions. Uh, I think it's four or five different new regions, five new regions that have been announced, the closest one being in, uh, uh, in London. And <clears throat> then coming back to identity and access management, which is one of my favorite topics. Why one of my favorite topics? Because this allows you to really implement the core principle of least privilege. What identities do you have and what do you want these identities to do on AWS? One example may be I have a set of files and the set of files can only be accessed from within my firewall between 9 to 5 by these specific individuals if they use 2FA. Very, very restricted. On the other hand, I also have my public website. And my public website needs to be up and running 24 hours 7 and literally the whole world should be able to see it and please let the whole world see it. So security over here again is not this switch, it really depends what do you want to achieve and how do you want to achieve it. One interesting thing about identity and access management is that in our situation identities is not just referring to persons. Like a person A can do this, person B can do this. In our situation, identities also refers to AWS services. I can have my EC2 machine to access this specific S3 bucket and not that specific S3 bucket. How do I do that? I, provide, I create a role, I create a set of access policies as restricted as possible, least privilege, and I assign it to my EC2. <clears throat> Now, let's go down. Networking. So what do you do in terms of networking and security? Well, the thing is, you do build a big firewall, but also you build like lots of lots of different firewalls inside the big firewall. And we call this your VPC, your own virtual private cloud. You define your virtual private cloud, you assign your set of IP addresses, and within that network, which is totally yours, you start to create your subnets, you start to create your routing. It's all similar to what you do on-premise. You want changes, it's API-driven, things are in effect immediately. And then on top of that, what you do is you use security <coughs> groups. And what are security groups? Security groups are a concept that you apply to a set of EC2 machines or IDS and you allow them to communicate with a certain other types of uh, services. So for example, I've got one security group, you can only talk internally and externally only or 3389 is open to the rest of the world, as an example. Which means you make it highly secure. <clears throat> and then what you can do, you can access your VPC the way you like. You can use a dedicated private connection, direct connect, or alternatively a logical VPN channel, or what you do is you create an internet gateway and you access your VPC over the public internet. <clears throat> now, within your VPC, so within your VPC, you start to create your compute, you start to create your virtual machines, you start to create your databases, and you start to build your applications. And this is pretty similar to what you currently do on-prem. In terms of what you typically do, you create golden images, you have them connect or not to your existing active directory, <coughs> you apply your own security principles, and you use that as a starting point for your internal customers to create new uh, virtual machines. We provide, from AWS perspective, a set of OSs and a set of standard images and you're totally free 
to update those, or alternatively, you can also import your own image from the on-premise environment. <coughs> and <coughs> that brings me back to encryption. So what do you do with encryption? First of all, encrypt all of your data. Second of all, how you want to do that is a variety of ways. I mean, one way is use server-side encryption. Within S3, it's literally a tick in the box. We manage encryption keys, all of your data is encrypted. Other one is use our KMS service. And KMS service, key management service, which is part of our identity and access management service in the console, which allows you to create keys and to use them within uh, your AWS portfolio. And the last one is Cloud HSM, we touched on it earlier, which allows you to fully own a dedicated encryption module. By the way, be aware if you use that, don't call it AWS in terms of your encryption keys. <laughs> so KMS, one click encryption, and it allows you to do, uh, to apply policies in terms of automatic uh, key rotation, in terms of the timeline, and use your encryption to uh, encrypt S3, Glacier, RDS, or anything else. And what we do, we use dedicated hardware modules uh, in order to store this KMS, highly durable. We take care of durability and uh, high, availability, high availability. At the same time, if you want to use your own dedicated module, what you can do, you can have your own safe net, um, use your own encryption keys, and uh, have Cloud HSM AWS. Make sure it's redundant. We typically recommend at least two, preferably three, in order to make sure you don't lose any of the encryption, and you can also uh, connect it back to on-premise in order to make sure you have a, a backup on-premise. <coughs> now, Security job zero. Different way of looking at security, a shared model, and the visibility and auditability. But now it's interesting, so now we have all of this framework, and now it also comes back, so how do you respond? How can you be agile and secure at the same time, and how can you make sure your reactions are appropriate and preferably automated? And <clears throat> Starting point is logging, and we have CloudWatch Logs. And what does CloudWatch Logs allow you to do? It allows you to centralize all the various log files that you want to store. Recommendation is log as much as possible, and then apply your policies on top. And apply your policies on top. Maybe a policy like somebody logged in 10 times, and you know, if that happens, please raise a red flag or block this user or provide any automated action. Try to make sure that all of the responses to the maximum extent possible are automated. And if there's any human intervention, human intervention really needs to be like, what is happening here? We don't need to change anything. <clears throat> and that brings me to the point of security and agility. What we really believe that Cloud technologies, AWS cloud technologies, allow you to be more agile while being secure at the same time. <coughs> auditing. Well, I've never been there speaking to somebody who said auditing is easy or is a fun thing to do, and I'm not sure if that's going to change, but at least what is changing right now is this. there's a variety of services that AWS provides which allows you to make auditing at least a little bit easier. And the service over here, we discussed a couple of them. You can use to store, to manage, uh, as an example, identity and access management allows you to see who was the last person logged in to my AWS account, or are these credentials actually being used in the last week? If not, why not delete them or check what is going on? <coughs> I'd like to, uh, to finish off with the uh, statement from Gartner. Actually, that's the fun part of doing security in the cloud. And uh, basically what Gartner was saying in the report, it was uh, uh, September last year, that indeed agility and security go together. You can use 
security in AWS, in the cloud, in order to achieve uh, business agility. By the way, the slides will be made available. Uh, also not in uh, an S3 bucket, no security on the bucket, so just make sure that everybody can, can download it. Six seconds left. Thank you very much.